my own welcome to all of you. It's actually great to, to see all of you again. Also, it's great to see our council table filling out with, uh, with more folks, um, and uh, especially the folks who are coming on or will be coming on. Um, it, it's going to be great working with you. Um, so I have the, the usual sets of things to try to cover every time it seems that four months you wouldn't think a lot's happened, but indeed, at least at our institute and our field, it just seems there's just a remarkable amount happening. Um, and so I want to try to highlight that. Um, by, at a personal level, I should point out um, I'm, I'm nearing the end of my rookie year as director, uh, only two and a half more months. Um, uh, with that said, uh, yeah, can you believe it, Richard? So two and a half more months, I'm end of my rookie year. And uh, it, it's a little insane, I have to admit, um, but I, I actually have developed a five-step program to recover my uh, sanity. Um, I'm actually going to explicitly mention steps two through five during my director's report. Um, I'll just tell you that step one is just to survive my rookie year without any major disasters or embarrassments to the Institute. Um, and uh, two and a half more months to go, and if I can just ride that one out, um, then I'll have uh, fulfilled step one. Uh, but I will tell you about the other four steps as we go along. Um, as with last time, we have uh, really tried to enhance um, the information that we can distribute to you and others who, you know, the Open Session of Council is uh, open by definition, and so we are trying as best we can to create an electronic resource, an archival resource, associated with each of my director's reports, which really reflects the contributions of dozens of people across the institute and a collection of lots of documents that you might find useful or you may a few weeks from now say, oh, I'd love to see that press release, I'd love to get that article, or I'd love to know about that website. So we've really organized uh, my entire talk around uh, this supplementary uh, website with an easy to remember URL, uh, genome.gov backslash director's report. Um, it stays that way until next council, and then it just gets moved into a different position with a different URL, but is all indexed relative to the date of the council meeting. So uh, pulling this together last minute is quite frenetic. Needless to say, we're, we're figuring out a rhythm to make it happen. My personal thanks to Larry Thompson and Judy Wyatt and other members of the web team. We were doing this most of the weekend, to be honest with you. Um, but all of my slides and all of these archival materials really will represent a permanent resource for you in case uh, there are things that I fly by and you want to get to, it'll all be available electronically. Uh, these are the seven things that I think are the best uh, uh, major categories to cover. Uh, work last time, so I'm going to just sort of organize everything I'm going to present around these seven areas. Um, and in fact, uh, the other thing to recognize is that uh, I do tailor my presentation now around what you are going to hear from others, um, just to make sure that we're, we're trying to avoid redundancy. Let me just give you a preview of what's going to happen in the open session today, uh, besides my director's report, is that um, I have, uh, there'll be three concept clearances, uh, one on Elsie Jean McEwen. Um, you will hear about the Therapeutics of Rare and Neglected Disease Program and a concept clearance that needs your involvement from Susan Old. And in an unusual circumstance, we actually need your, um, we need to put a concept clearance in front of you related to an intramural uh, initiative, and you'll be hearing later from Joan Bailey Wilson. Um, Today, uh, our, our, you as a council is due for the NIH director to come visit. Um, uh, and so a familiar face will be showing up, we believe, at 11.30. Uh, we are tracking him by GPS, so we'll see what, whether that time changes or not. Uh, but uh, this was uh, his turn to come to our council, and so he will be here, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, oh, I, that's right there. And then, uh, then Jane Peterson will be giving an update on the Human Microbiome Project. And then we will, I believe your requests, or some requests, I think from council, hear about our training programs. And there'll be a joint presentation by Betty Graham, Ken Lang, and Janet Sisheimer um, about some of our uh, institute's training programs. So that's the open session. And uh, now we just simply have to get through these seven categories uh, with my presentation, starting with uh, general NHGRI updates. Uh, let me tell you, it has, uh, it's been a bizarre year uh, for my rookie year at a lot of levels. It's actually been a bizarre year for the Bethesda area as well. Uh, some of these things have really stressed uh, the institute and stressed the leadership and stressed the people. You were, and it sort of comes by way of elements. So for example, one of the elements that stressed us out was water, uh, actually snow to be more specific. Many of you remember we actually ended up having to cancel the in-person council meeting because a ridiculous amount of snowfall for the DC area hit and, uh, and you couldn't get here. So we ended up having to cancel that meeting. So that was our water element that was crazy. And then some of you actually also endured the crazy summer that we had. You'd think with all the snow, things would have cooled down. But in fact, this was a record uh, DC summer. And those of you who made it to our early meeting got a taste of it in July. 
It just never let up all summer. It was just totally crazy. So we had to deal with fire elements. Um, it didn't end there. On July 16th, in a very rare occurrence, we actually had an earthquake here. Uh, 3.7 magnitude earthquake, and I it, notice it says it, it woke uh, most Maryland residents. Uh, it didn't wake all of us. Some of us are real early risers. Uh, I was, uh, I couldn't figure out what it was as I was just getting out of my shower, and I thought it was my air conditioning unit. And sure enough, I find out, you know, 20 minutes later, there actually was an earthquake. Uh, but about three million people felt it around the Mid-Atlantic region, um, and uh, fortunately, um, there wasn't too much damage. Uh, but that was because all the damage was waiting for nine days later when we had this horrific storm came through July 25th that actually uh, brought 75 mile an hour winds um, and all sorts of damaged trees and structures and so forth. Um, turns out it knocked out the power for a majority of residents that work at the Institute, certainly a large number, over 300,000 people, um, I think was the number, yeah, who lost power, uh, yeah, yours truly including. And so about three or four days after that, uh, lots of trash bags were being used to throw away huge amounts of freezer and fridge contents. It was really a, quite, a, quite a summer, needless to say. But this really stresses out the leadership, having to deal with water and fire, earth, and, and air, a uh, lot to do. So we actually get special training. And one of the things we had to do was to go see this grade B movie, as far as I could tell, uh, this summer um, to get training. Actually, uh, I'm actually on the right, and Mark Geyer is the one on the left, getting special <laughs> training for dealing with elements uh, and how they affect the Institute. So that's, that was sort of. Uh, uh, what we've been dealing with uh, since, uh, since actually two councils ago, but hopefully it won't be as crazy the next year. On a more serious note, um, there has been a very important update for me uh, at the Institute uh, for a variety of reasons, and that relates uh, to an email that many of you got, I think about a week or two ago, and relates to a very important senior level recruitment we made to the Institute, um, and that is uh, Dan Kastner, who will be our new scientific director. And Dan is sitting right over there, and he can just quickly stand. Let me tell you a little bit about You don't have to keep standing while I'm talking about you, Dan, because I'm going to go on a while, and you're going to get tired. So let me point out, there was a very rigorous search uh, that uh, pursued uh, the identification of the new uh, director of our intramural program, a position I had, I had held and unfortunately still hold, but only for a few more hours. Um, since 2002, uh, I want to give a personal thanks to Rick Myers, who was a council member who served on the search committee. Uh, we looked wide and far in, uh, inside the institute, outside the institute, within NIH, outside NIH. At the end of the day, the person we identified, uh, Dan Kastner, uh, was not really in our house, but he was in a neighboring house. He was in another institute in their intramural program, National Institute of um, Arthritis and Muscular Skeletal Disorders. Um, let me just briefly tell you about Dan. He uh, got a philosophy degree from Princeton University and then got an MD and a PhD um, from Baylor College of Medicine, where he also served as chief resident. He came to NIH in 1985 in the intramural program. That's, I think, a key part of the story, um, where he originally came for rheumatology fellowship training, uh, but then built his own research program to study um, the genetic basis of rheum uh, rheumatologic disorders and really did some pioneering work, uh, beginning with uh, understanding the genetic basis of familial Mediterranean fever, and then going on to identify other genes that are very important in disorders of inflammation. What, what is, I think, very important for our intramural program that Dan brings to this job is he is a physician and a scientist, and a very active physician scientist. He's been clinically active in the NIH Clinical Center since he came here in 85 but meanwhile has built a first-rate research program and has really shown the way of how to do uh, clinical research uh, at NIH, which occasionally has its own uh, unique challenges, um, but at the same time has taken major leadership responsibilities along the way. He's gotten practically every title uh, since 85, everything from, from branch chiefs to laboratory chiefs and others. He currently serves as the clinical director of, of, at NIAMS, um, and, uh, and our clinical director is Bill Gall. In fact, they're very good friends and colleagues. But Dan has also has a very important title that he got several years ago where he was asked to take on an NIH-wide responsibility as being the NIH deputy director for intramural clinical research. And so I think that appointment really uh, signifies the fact that he's regarded as one of the, the key leaders in clinical research within the intramural program. And uh, that was very attractive uh, to us, especially at this moment in time, thinking about applications of genomics and believing that our intramural program should play a major role in and helping to, to pilot efforts and think about ways to do this and to, to really pursue it aggressively because of the advantages of having the strong clinical infrastructure in our clinical center. Um, and so this just came very apparent to us that Dan would be a terrific person to come over to our institute and uh, leave his clinical director responsibilities and, and take on the scientific director role. And uh, he agreed to do so. 
Um, we're not the only ones that have seen uh, Dan as an outstanding person uh, to, in his professional pursuits. Uh, he's a, a member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation. Um, he's a member, an elected member of the uh, Association of American Physicians. And uh, just this year, in fact, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So we are delighted. Uh, I am personally delighted that effective on October 10th of this year, that's 10, 10, 10, I will no longer be the acting scientific director and Dan will become the scientific director of the Institute. And our plan will be to have Dan present to council. Um, whether we do it in February or September, we'll figure that out. Um, but um, as I often would come and present to council every year, year and a half, we will certainly want to have uh, Dan come and present to you to update the council about what is going on uh, with our intramural program. And uh, some of his ideas, which I guarantee you will push the frontiers of clinical research opportunities in genomics. So getting Dan on board and shedding my responsibility as acting scientific director is step number two towards getting my sanity. Um, this does leave the fact that we still have some important leadership um, things to do. Um, I'm acting SD, but that is going to change. And uh, that leaves uh, Mark. Um, he has his own sanity issues, but Mark has to still remain the acting uh, deputy director of the Institute. And uh, I, we've got this accomplished, uh, but who's going to replace Mark in his acting position? Well, you're going to help us do that because just a week or so ago, or maybe it's now 12 days ago, uh, we launched this search. Um, and all of you got an email, I believe, or should have, um, about our launching of the search. And this is the advertisement that will appear in journals probably even this week. Um, this is a very important appointment for the Institute. It's a very important appointment to me um, personally. Uh, Alan Guttmacher, uh, as you know, was our deputy director for many years. Um, I thought he did an absolutely terrific job. I would love, if you know, uh, if you know of a mini Alan out there, that would be terrific. Um, uh, we are, uh, I just charged the search committee uh, last week uh, with uh, their efforts. In fact, they are out very active. Joanne Bauman, for example, is a member of our search committee and she's doing a terrific job making lots of phone calls, contacts, and we are really just trying to network out there. I, I uh, firmly believe that we're going to probably identify the right candidate by one of you helping us or one of you being interested, perhaps. Um, but needless to say, this is going to be the major recruitment focus of, of the Institute right now. And it is step three uh, to my uh, sanity recovery because uh, we really need a deputy director uh, in, for, for many kinds of things that we want to do, especially now that we have a scientific director on board. Um, the other, uh, if I think about what have been the biggest things that have happened, that, yeah, Rick? So, does that describe um, I think you, in, in very generic ways, um, but what I will tell you, as I told the search committee, is um, unlike the scientific director position, which I think is, is, while every institute's a little different, there are some very standard things that have to be done for that. I think if you looked across the NIH and you looked at all the different deputy directors, they come in various flavors and backgrounds. And, um, and, and so I, it's not cookie cutter. So what I would say is I could tell you the range, the menu of things I would want of a deputy, but I don't need all five of them. I mean, if they would just get two or three of those, that would be terrific. Um, sure, well, actually, yes, we, we can do that. We actually have some bullets that we, the search committee asked us to put together to summarize what I told them when I charged them and happy to, happy to share that. So yeah, we can do that. Um, I think the biggest thing that happened at the Institute this year was this uh, the early meeting uh, in July, which was sort of the, the finale aspect in some ways of our strategic planning process. Um, I thought it was a great meeting. I was particularly delighted that many council members were able to make it. I know not every one of you could, but, but, but remarkably most of you did. Um, and it was, uh, it, I thought it was just great and, uh, at, every, at every level. I would point out uh, many of you worked long into the evening at some of the breakout groups and some of the discussions, um, but it really was a pivotal point to get very constructive feedback to help us really focus down on what we were thinking and uh, what we had down on paper, what was right, what was wrong, what needed refinement. I will tell you it had a major impact on refining the document. And as all of you know, we're now in the final stages of refining that document with the aim of publishing it sort of the next four to six months is the, is the likely scenario. Um, and so this has been a very important part of our year. I will tell you it's certainly consuming a lot of Mark Geyer's and my and a handful of others' time uh, just sort of getting that thing across the finish line. This, getting this plan, this new strategic plan, published is absolutely step four of my sanity recovery. And um, I'm very much looking forward to, to getting it out, um, but also want to make sure we get it right. 
few things I wanted to say about the early meeting, because we did it, we tried some experiments, and we're doing lots of this, lots of things we're just trying. Um, and, uh, and so some, there were some novel components that I actually think, in retrospect, worked quite well. Uh, we did video cast um, that meeting. Um, uh, we video cast it to institute staff members who couldn't make it, uh, or we didn't have room to accommodate, because we'd only have a, about 220, 230 people there. But also, there were a lot of invitees um, who just couldn't travel for whatever reason or didn't want to come and melt in our heat. So, uh, but we offered them the ability to join us by uh, video casting. In addition, as many of you remember, um, uh, we uh, solicited from you and got names and from others, and I personally invited um, over 100 uh, genomics and genetics trainees, everything from graduate students to postdocs to clinical trainees. About 108 at the end were invited to participate uh, remotely. Um, uh, by, by video casting in and also participating in, in a blog that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. Uh, at the end, we had active viewers from 26 states. Uh, the, the most active states were Maryland and uh, Massachusetts. Um, we even had some viewers from China, for example. Uh, the peak on, on day, third day of the meeting, with the second full day of the meeting, uh, we had at one point 261 people, um, who, at least IP addresses, that were accessing. So we truly did reach, practically doubled the number of people uh, that were in the room by being able to watch remotely, which we thought uh, was great. I'll also tell you one other thing about the trainees is that um, several weeks after the early meeting, uh, we invited the trainees who had participated to join a conference call with Mark Geyer and I and uh, some other institute staff just to listen to see what they had to say, figuring that they had they could have private time with institute leadership. And it was a good discussion. We talked for a little over an hour. And, um, some of, their, some of their concerns and some of their ideas were spot on in, in many ways. And so I, think, I, think, I hope they got something out of it. I, I got several emails afterwards indicating that indeed they did. So again, it was a way to reach out to our trainees I thought was quite nice. And then we tried this microblog, um, which is sort of becoming the rage around here. Um, um, this was a, a, a bit of an experiment in some ways, but it's as much of a cultural experiment as anything else. Um, uh, I welcomed uh, the microblog with sort of an opening um, comment, and then, uh, wow, they just flew in. I mean, we had 186 registered users of this microblog during the meeting. We had uh, almost 1,500 comments or tweets or whatever they're called uh, that were posted over the three days. Uh, four ad hoc groups were created to sort of be able to converse amongst themselves. I think it was widely viewed as a success, and, um, and in many ways, this is sort of becoming sort of a part of our culture at our institute. There's now been several meetings we've had and workshops where we've run blogs and, and people enjoy them and I think it hasn't been very disruptive to the meeting at all. Um, feedback is, but, um, but in any case, I just think it's something that we're gonna continue to try as part of some of our meetings. Who knows, maybe someday we'll even try a microblog associated with an open session of council. That would be probably a little controversial, but what the heck, we might even think about that. Um, um, I, I will tell you, actually, by the way, um, that, uh, again, as part of sort of the use of electronic dimensions, uh, if it's working, and I don't know if anybody can nod and say it is, we're allegedly video casting the open session. Of, it is working. I'm getting a thumbs up. So this is live um, out to uh, certainly people within NIH, but actually you can, if anybody who happened to learn about this by getting on our website um, and seeing it, we, we sort of pulled this together at the last minute, but we are video casting the open session of council, as actually do some other institutes. Um, so this is not, that's not. Where, the cameras? Where are the cameras? Uh, Larry, there's one. That's right. There's definitely that one that's probably pointed at me, and there's another one there. I don't know if they can pan or not, but, uh, but there, and there's a lot of secret ones that are planted, Rick, in various places, so. Okay, uh, again, c moving along, um, just announced, I think it was either a week ago or a week and a half ago, um, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, or otherwise known as PCASE Awards, which habitually seem to be behind. I used to actually blame it on the previous administration, um, why they were always like a year or two off compared to the calendar, but these are just the fiscal year 2009, even though we're most of the way through fiscal year 2010. So I don't totally understand why it's always behind. But, um, we actually are delighted that there are four researchers uh, um, among a relatively elite small group of researchers that have NHGRI affiliations in some way or relationships with us. So I wanted to share this with you. So one of the PCASE awardees is a, a very talented physician scientist in our intramural program, a gentleman named Chuck Venditti, um, who's a tenure track investigator of maybe about almost approaching the halfway point in his tenure track. Um, and, uh, and again, very active physician scientist. We were delighted he got this. 
And then not at our institute, but actually affiliated with us, Brian Brooks is an investigator in the National Eye Institute. And Brian actually has one of about five adjunct appointments with our intramural program. We give those out very uh, rarely, uh, but we gave one to him. Um, and he's uh, actually been collaborator with us and quite involved with us. He's a, uh, obviously an ophthalmologist, also a physician scientist. And so we were very proud that he got one as well. Uh, Manolis Kellis, who many of you know, was an associate professor at MIT and is an NHGRI grantee, um, is among the awardees. And then Bradley Mallon, who's also an extramural grantee, who's assistant professor at Vanderbilt, who's a merge investigator. And so we're, we're, we're really quite impressed. Uh, genomics clearly is getting lots of attention. And uh, these folks, uh, two of them within the intramural program, one in ours and one affiliated with us, and then two of our extramural grantees are among these four. Uh, there'll be a ceremony sometime, I think, in the next couple months, and, uh, and they should usually get to meet the president and so forth. So this is a, it'll be a big deal for them. Um, turning our attention to money um, and appropriations I would, let me, and, uh, and budget, let me just give you a couple updates, um, although not much new is sort of the theme of my updates. Uh, this fiscal year, uh, we actually, is, I, I was able to report this last time, this is where we are now um, with about another two, two and a half weeks left in the fiscal year. Um, and uh, in, in terms of next year, this is what the president's budget looks like. Uh, with the NIH overall getting about a $1 billion increase. Uh, it's about a 3.2% increase, uh, which is about equal to the rate of biomedical inflation. Uh, we should actually be pleased uh, to even get that. Um, and uh, considering the tight budget climate we're in and big cuts to other parts of both the bill that this sits in, but also um, other, other bills as well. Um, these, uh, the, the appropriations bill is, has only sort of been considered and marked up within committee. It hasn't gotten outside of the, the relevant committees yet. Um, uh, but this is what it's looking like. You will note that NHGRI is slated for a slightly higher than average increase. This is because, and I don't know if Francis will talk about this or not, uh, but it's not an across the board increase for all institutes. Francis has implemented a circumstance, at least this fiscal year, next fiscal year, whereby uh, your increase is partially dictated by how well your program aligns with his five themes. And good news was we aligned well with his five themes, so we did a little better than average. So at the moment, we're looking at 3.5%. Um, but you know this is a, it's a crazy year, right? And so the midterm election's coming up. Uh, as a result of that, it's unlikely, almost for certain, we're not going to have a, a real budget. We will be under a continuing resolution almost for certain. October 1, it's also likely eventually our, our, our bill will get sort of bundled with an omnibus bill as opposed to just being approved on its own. Um, that's only happened a couple times in the last decade. So, and when that happens is anybody's guess. There have been some thoughts maybe by December, January, we would get an omnibus bill through and we'd have our budget. But we'll see, uh, fingers crossed, I think it's hard to know what would happen. A continuing resolution for the whole year would be uh, un un unfortunate. Uh, because we would miss out on at least a three and a half or three percent increase, and that would make a huge, huge difference at a lot of levels. I will tell you that um, you know 2012 doesn't look so great at the moment. Uh, there's been lots of discussion about across the board um, domestic spending cuts. Um, I will tell you that we were asked fairly recently, as part of a very open process in terms of memos coming out from the Office of Management and Budget, asking all federal agencies to come up with plans for possible cuts. Um, in 2012, uh, we were asked internally to go through an exercise of figuring out if we faced a 5% cut, what would that look like? Um, uh, we have gotten signals from, from the NIH leadership that if a cut would happen, it would, it would not be across the board equal. So once again, it would be a matter of how it aligned to the overall agency's priorities. But still, it, any sort of word of a cut makes everybody very nervous and uncomfortable, understandably. So. We will see, but um, you know, you're, you're watching the same news I'm watching, and it's, it's, it's dicey out there uh, politically and budgetarily and so forth. OK, so those were my uh, institute-specific uh, updates. Let me move on to NIH updates. Uh, start off, speaking of rookie years, um, Francis survived his. Um, so uh, many of you may have seen this article um, that came out of Nature about uh, sort of a summary of his first year at the helm. Um, uh, you will be hearing from Francis uh, in just a couple of hours or, or so. Um, he has had no shortage of complexities and surprises, as I'm sure he will share with you. I'm sure he has his own multi-step program to recovering his sanity. I'm not sure what it looks like. I do know one aspect of it, which I will go through a little bit, is he's told me, on, uh, like myself, he has just spent a huge amount of time recruiting. 
Um, he's had a lot of very senior positions to fill, um, but he's gotten significant traction even in the last four months, and so I'm going to show you that in the next uh, four slides. So, for example, as many of you know, Raynard Kington, the previous uh, principal deputy director, uh, left to become president of Grinnell College, um, and that's very recent. Um, but uh, Larry, T following um, uh, you know, uh, an internal uh, search and evaluation, uh, Larry Tabak uh, was identified and appointed as the new principal deputy director at NIH. Um, he had previously been the director of the National Institute of Dental and Cranial Facial Research since 2000. Prior to that, he was held several leadership positions at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry, including um, Senior Associate Dean for Research and Director of the Center for Oral Biology, Professor of Dentistry, and Professor of Biochemistry and Biophysics. He has his own uh, research program that focuses on the biosynthesis and function of use in glycoproteins. But in the past handful of years, he's really um, distinguished himself in taking on many major trans-NIH uh, roles. He was the acting principal deputy director, the role he now has permanently, um, from November uh, 2008 until August 2009, when Rainer Kington was acting director of NIH, Larry stepped in to be his deputy. And so he's already sort of experienced this job. And then most recently, he continues to be right now the director of the NIH Division of Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiatives, which I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides, uh, which is where the Common Fund lives. And he's been acting director of that. And I think really has done a fantastic job. And I think that's why it was very uh, clear that he was a terrific person to take on this new responsibility. Um, Isabel Garcia, who's currently the deputy director at the Dental Institute, will act as uh, director until a permanent uh, new director is, is identified. On the extramural side of the deputy director um, uh, um, grouping, if you will, uh, Sally Rocky was previously the acting deputy director for extramural research um, following the search has been appointed the, the permanent director. Um, she had been acting director since fall of 2008. She'd been at NIH something like eight or nine years and very experienced seasoned extramural uh, program um, uh, leader and now will, will serve as the deputy director for extramural research. Um, this was a very important recruitment, I know, uh, for Francis. So uh, Dee Poughkeepsie, as we call it internally, because it just has so many ridiculous words associated with the title, Division of Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiatives, just think of, I mean, it does a lot of things in terms of all of its words, uh, planning and coordinating and evaluating and so forth. What's most relevant to us is that this is the home of the Common Fund, um, previously known as the Roadmap. And so this is uh, 450, half a billion dollars, something like the 450 million, 500 million dollars common fund money. And so this individual is, has a responsibility of a pretty important portfolio of activity. And so it was uh, wonderful that uh, search committee and uh, was able to identify great candidates. And Francis was able to recruit um, Jim Anderson, who's currently the professor and chair of the Department of Cell and Molecular Physiology at University of North Carolina School of Medicine. Um, he has extensive clinical experiences, both um, as an internist and a hepatologist. Um, he's considered one of the top authorities in the world in, his, uh, in, in the area of tight junctions and paracellular transport. And he's been an NIH grantee for almost 20 years. Um, he will be um, arriving uh, later this month. Uh, I have not met him yet, but it's high on both of our agendas uh, to get to know each other. I would tell you this is actually very important for our institute. Why? Because we have, as an institute, a crazy disproportionate amount of responsibility for co-running common fund programs, um, as I'll get to later on. And I think you know. And it, part of it is because we're good at it. And part of it is because a lot of the things that are being done, we have such experience in terms of running these consortium and, and sort of managing these kinds of programs. And so there's no question, and I know he already realizes this, that, um, that this is a very important relationship and interaction. And so. Um, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to getting to know him, and I'm sure he desperately wants to get to know us because we have so much responsibility for things that are now going to be his responsibility. Um, so I'm, I would imagine, I don't know if it'll be next council or the one after, but there's no question we're going to want to have him come present to council um, because I'm sure he has ideas on how some of this might even change in the future. And I think that's one of the ideas is to think about Common Fund and how all these things are decided upon, organized, and so forth. I, I know Francis is looking for sort of new ideas for sort of the next version of this under new leadership. And as I mentioned earlier, Larry Tabak continues to be acting for another week or two until Jim Anderson arrives. Um, in the area of behavioral and social sciences research, the NIH has this office called the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, or OBSSR. 
um, and has been under acting leadership for some time, but now uh, Robert Kaplan from UCLA um, has been uh, recruited to come lead that office. He's a distinguished professor in the Department of Health Services at the School of Public Health in the Department of Medicine. His research interests include behavioral medicine, health services research, health outcome measurements, and multivariate data analysis. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. He actually won't arrive until early 2011. Um, but again, I think for some of the things that our, both our intramural uh, researchers are involved with and some of the things we've thought about on our extramural side are involved in, uh, this could also be another important relationship to think about. And um, the, the, the next important appointment that Francis was able to make is a familiar face, one that is making many of us just smile uh, when this was announced. Uh, and that is that Alan Guttmacher, after serving as uh, acting director of this institute, and then uh, being stolen to be the acting director of the Child Health Institute, um, uh, applied for and was successful in, in um, being appointed uh, the new director of, of uh, NICHD. And uh, we, we just think this is great. And later on, I'll even tell you about already some of the ways you can imagine we will now be able to interact with that institute. Um, and we're, we're thinking of all sorts of things such a natural interaction uh, between the two institutes and having Alan at the helm, uh, we're, we're, we're just certain that this is going to sort of be a new era uh, with, with those two institutes. And speaking of awesome relationships uh, with, uh, with other institutes, uh, this is going to, this is game changing as well. Um, as, as you heard about at last council that Harold was, I, uh, we were successful in convincing Harold to come take, to come back to NIH for the second time, his second return to NIH, uh, this time as the head of the Cancer Institute. Um, and uh, and it's, it's just wonderful to have him here. I'll have a few comments to make when we get to TCGA, obviously a very important part and a very important aspect of our relationship with NCI. Um, if you're interested, by the way, um, on document 10 within there, there's actually a whole video you could watch of his town hall meeting that he had after he arrived. And if you're interested, you might want to watch that. Uh, the other development, by the way, um, which I think I told you last time, but now is in, in full motion, is that Harold uh, needed to find a home for his intramural lab, and one of the terms to actually come back as NCI director was that he would be allowed to have his intramural lab within our, our institute's intramural program. And so we, uh, we said absolutely that was fine, uh, we'd love that. And so he is now, uh, his lab actually first person's arrived already, another one's on the way in a couple weeks, um, and I'll be running a small group uh, right there in building 50 in the middle of, um, uh, uh, of our intramural program. Um, this, this, this actually brings up uh, sort of step five of my five-step uh, recovery to, uh, to get sane again, is I actually made the personal decision to sort of phase out my own research program. I just simply felt I couldn't do this job well and continue to maintain the kind of lab I'd want to maintain. This actually became Harold's uh, fortune because uh, Harold needed to hire uh, some senior technician or two uh, to run his lab, and that just worked out great. I had uh, a couple, uh, one of which has worked with me for almost 20 years, and just on the same floor, was just able to slide over and set up his lab for him and a very experienced uh, a lab manager. And so uh, my decision for getting uh, sane actually worked to Harold's benefit, and now uh, two of my lab members are becoming part of his lab. Um, so those are the recruitments I wanted to tell you about. Um, so a few other things uh, general NIH-wide I wanted to share with you. Um, one was just something that just happened just a few weeks ago um, that relates a, a political event, of course, um, that involved the vice president. Um, and it involved a major announcement that the White House made, uh, including a report um, that talked about how uh, the, the impact of ERA funding had on uh, various uh, sectors, but with a real emphasis on science. Um, and needless to say, NIH was prominently featured in this. And so under document 11, there's all sorts of things we shared with you, a press release, the actual report, uh, which is shown um, on, on the upper left, and uh, also some of Biden's statements uh, in, in prepared remarks. And there's just uh, three of them that you can read there. You can just sort of see how genomics and, 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 and various aspects of, of disease and cancer and genome sequencing sort of heavily got in. I think probably had quite a bit to do with that, or certainly NIH did. But it was this big event down at the, at the one of the buildings near the White House. And uh, we were asked to, to send some of our staff and to send some of our grantees. Uh, three of our staff members went, and seven of our grantees went. I think one of them was Ross. You were there, right? And, um, and I, everything I heard about it was it was terrific um, for a variety of reasons, not to least of which to have the vice president um, singing praises about your own research activities. Um, but also just uh, I, I think the vice president actually spent time with folks. 
Uh, there he is uh, yelling at Jeff Schloss for something. I don't know why, or at least doing something to make Jeff wince. And, um, and then the lower picture has uh, the vice president meeting uh, Debbie Nickerson, you can see, and uh, Steve Turner and Stuart Lindsay, so several of our grantees. And so this was, it was a very nice event, and I, I encourage you, to, if you're interested, to see what the vice president had to say, to read his remarks or to look more closely at that report. Also on the NIH stage, uh, re relevant to genetics, has been a, a, a pretty significant uh, new development re re uh, related to genetic testing. Um, something that uh, obviously Francis cares a lot about, Kathy Hudson, NIH chief of staff, cares a lot about, and uh, with them on the scene, uh, it was inevitable that there was going to be some action on this front. Um, by way of background, many of you know, there's about 1,600 genetic tests are available to patients and consumers, but there's no single public resource that provides detailed information about them. So in March, uh, in March, NIH announced it was going to create a public database for searching information that would be submitted voluntarily by genetic test providers. This was called the Genetic Testing Registry, or GTR. And it aims to enhance access to information about the availability, the validity, and usefulness of genetic tests. And uh, you can imagine that interacting with all the different stakeholders, everybody from the people who develop these tests to the people who manufacture them, to healthcare providers, to patients and consumer groups, as well as researchers, is going to be a critical part to make this thing work, especially if it's, it's going to be voluntary. Um, but um, it's off and running. There, there was a, a request for comments about the genetic testing registry posted in the Federal Registry, um, the Federal Register in June, and there have been lots of comments that have been received. So it's still early days on this, but it certainly is an important development that the kind of thing has been talked about for a long time and is, is now getting traction. I don't know if Francis is going to talk about this or not, but I'm sure he'll happily take questions if you have uh, detailed questions about it. What I am certain Francis will talk about, and I'll just set him up, uh, because it is also relevant for one of the, the concept clearance you're going to hear, is there is a, he will use the T word, I guarantee you. Uh, therapeutics is a huge emphasis of attention by NIH leadership um, and increasingly across all the institutes. Um, it touches our institute as well um, in, in various ways. Um, um, in particular, I will tell you that there's just been continued intense developmental activities around um, this thing called the Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Diseases, or TREND program, um, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, from Susan Old but also this thing called the Cures Acceleration Network, which was built, built into the healthcare reform legislation. And um, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that are just, just sort of crazy complex. Um, at the moment, TREND and the Chemical Genomics Center, which was part of the roadmap, which sort of feeds into all this, and the Cures Acceleration Network, as it likely will start to get initiated next year, all live within NHGRI at the moment. Um, and, uh, and administratively, that has all, it just, it's just complicated. It's probably the best way I would, I would phrase. And um, whether that's true long term or not is a whole separate issue. But I'm not going to say much more about it because I know Francis will talk about it and Susan Old will have a specific concept clearance around trend to talk to you about. But needless to say, um, this, this is something that um, is big and that we have been asked to step in and really help, at least at an interim basis, sort of incubate some of this stuff as it, as it starts to grow up. Okay, so let me move beyond um, uh, NIH and, and sort of look more globally at the genomics uh, as a field um, and just sort of give you some highlights that have come up over the last uh, four months. Uh, one of the highlights was June 26th, because June 26th marked uh, the 10th anniversary of the announcement of the draft sequence of the human genome. Lots of media attention, uh, appropriately so. Um, for, there was this piece I'm sure many of you saw in, in Nature. Uh, there was a very nice, uh, and all this, by the way, all these clippings are available under Document 13. Uh, Harold Varmus wrote a nice uh, piece in New England Journal. Uh, Nicholas Wade had his, had his own idea about things, um, as did Craig Venter. Um, and then Andrew Pollack as well uh, wrote, wrote a piece about this. So sort of a lot of media attention, good, bad, other, it's the usual. Those clippings are just highlighted here. Um, and you can see, and even Charlie Rose got into the act and had a whole interview with uh, Eric Lander and Francis Collins about this. And this was all fine. I thought it was great. A lot of attention uh, brought to bear about this. I think we will similarly see a lot of attention um, uh, in, in February with the, the 10th anniversary of the publication of the, the two draft sequences of the human genome. Um, one other piece, uh, by the way, I just sort of made a separate slide for it. Document 14, if you hadn't seen, uh, Jeffrey Carr wrote a multi-component piece in The Economist 
uh, which was published all in one big special issue, but the fact is you can get to all of it on the web. And if you haven't seen this, I, you might take a look at it. Um, and and you can, through, through links, you can get to all five or six parts of the series. And so again, it's a nice uh, story that he talks about, uh, again, commemorating the 10th anniversary. We did our own thing to try to stimulate um, science writers uh, to encourage them to write about this important milestone and also to provide any background and education material. So um, our communications and public liaison branch organized a science writers workshop back in June, um, the goal of which was to simply help them uh, write stories. Uh, and to really uh, help inform them about uh, sort of the significance of the last 10 years. I served as the MC of this event. Francis came and spoke. Sharon Terry was our lunchtime speaker. We had about 50 people who attended this in downtown DC, about 25 uh, media uh, journalists from 25 media outlets, including New York Times, USA Today, Washington Post, Newsweek, Science, and Nature attended. We had about another 25 science writers from communications offices uh, sprinkled across NIH and CDC and FDA attended as well. And all of this was videotaped and is available on the web. And so again, on document 15, you can get to links that will get you know, all the background materials and all the videotapes of all of these um, uh, four science writer level uh, lectures that were given. Um, we, there was, it did stimulate um, some writing. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, writers who came and attended that workshop wrote this featured piece in USA Today on the last day of the early meeting that came out, not just coincidentally, on July 8th. So we thought that was a successful outcome of that workshop that USA Today wrote a very nice story. So that's on the, that's on the uh, sort of media front, what's going on on the legislative front. And here there, there are a few things to highlight um, uh, uh, that I just wanted to touch on. Um, there is a, a, a new bill that, um, which is a bit of a reformed previous version or a new version of a previously formulated bill on personalized medicine. This is the Genomics and Personalized Medicine Act of 2010, sponsored by Representative Kennedy of Rhode Island. Uh, the bill would create an office of personalized health care in the secretary's office. It would provide a grant-making structure through which um, the department would fund projects to advance the field. It would establish a national biobank, and it would attempt to improve clinical genetic testing regulation. Um, it's really not expected to move, uh, certainly not in this session, unclear what will happen to it. There have been other similar bills that have sort of uh, hung around. Um, so we'll see. It's something we are monitoring. It's something we've been asked to, to give some input about, but um, it's unclear how much traction it's going to get. Um, in terms of stimulating other activities on Capitol Hill, it's notable Francis gave a very major uh, testimony in front of the House Energy and Commerce's Subcommittee on Health. Um, he talked about um, a, a variety of things. Obviously, his five themes. Uh, he certainly talked about some of the conflict of interest issues that are worrying some members of Congress. And he talked about uh, the Gulf oil spill and, and follow-up studies I'm going to talk about later in my director's report. Um, it was regarded as a very good hearing uh, that usually when Francis goes to Capitol Hill, it's always a good hearing. But, um, so, uh, but it's worth pointing that out. And the only other thing I would say about um, on the legislative front is that uh, when I first became director, um, there was sort of a, a, a there, there was the middle of health care reform. And at that time, there was actually uh, I don't know if I wasn't allowed. I think I actually wasn't allowed. Uh, they really wanted to only have any interactions uh, uh, with it from the department with members of Congress focused around health care reform. A lot of you know, really keeping track of the of the of the of the topics and uh, focus on health care reform. And once health care reform was done, that all changed. And then it, it is apparently uh, quite customary for uh, new institute directors to go and start to build relationships, get to know folks, especially those in Congress who are interested in genomics, personalized medicine, and so forth. And so uh, they started to let me out. That's sort of the best way to phrase it. So uh, uh, Laura Rodriguez and I and some other staff members have gone now about three or four times down to Capitol Hill, um, in some cases being asked to go and, uh, and on, uh, by invitation, I mean, getting invited to please come. They want to meet us. And so um, I've gone and had uh, actually two meetings, one brief one, one much longer one uh, with Congresswoman Slaughter from New York, a longtime friend of the Institute and a champion of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, I went and met uh, um, uh, with Jim Langevin, who's a, a Democrat from Rhode Island, a strong supporter of stem cell research and very interested in biomedical research, actually quite interested in coming out and having a tour of some of our facilities. That'll likely happen. And then uh, most recently, uh, we met, uh, went and met with Congressman Burgess, who I've actually met before, who's a congressman from Texas, who's a physician. He's, a, he's an obstetrician. And has a lot of interest um, in, uh, in personal genomics, 
I got there, he, when I met with him, he instantly told me about, you know, his 23andMe results and Navigenetics results, and he had just gotten on himself. And so, I mean, he's very interested in this, and it'll come up a little bit later in my director's report, some of the activities that are going on in Congress. So those sorts of interactions are continuing. There's actually uh, plans for some additional ones as well, and, uh, and that, that's actually a very good thing. So speaking of that, speaking of personal genomics, that was my segue. There has been a lot of action going on in the last few months um, in the arena of personal genomics, um, and uh, especially around direct-to-consumer genetic services. Uh, just by way of background, there's obviously some growing concern over the unregulated nature of the industry, increasing amounts of medical information being provided directly to consumers, um, concerns about different companies providing um, different information uh, to the same customers, sometimes conflicting. And uh, is, it, is, is that going to be a healthy situation without having a clinician involved? And uh, should these be regulated? Uh, should these companies be regulated? If so, who should be doing it? And so some of this sort of, there's a lot of angles to this story. Some of you probably even know it better than I do or more involved. But the FDA contacted um, 21 direct-to-consumer companies. Um, asking them about uh, what they're doing in terms of getting pre-market approval for their tests. Um, FDA considers their products devices, not lab-developed tests, and then sort of and actually asked each of these companies to come meet with FDA to discuss their tests and what would be needed for approval. Um, meanwhile, and quite related, the House Committee on Energy and Commerce had a, a, a hearing uh, that in part was prompted by Pathway Genomics Plan uh, to sell test kits at Walgreens, if you recall. And it also was partially based on some high-profile high profile lab errors that were made to, by 23andMe, where 87 customers got the wrong results. And so there was this, this testimony, there was this hearing that took place. Here's a, a sort of a screen capture, if you will, of the four individuals who testified. Um, uh, Jim Evans, who's a geneticist at the University of North Carolina, and then representatives from uh, three of these companies, including Pathway Genomics. Um, uh, Jeff Shuren, who's the director of the Center for Devices and Radiographic, uh, Radiological Health at the FDA, also testified and told the committee that FDA has plans to regulate the sales of direct-to-consumer genetic tests and that FDA does consider these tests to be medical devices. All three companies at the hearing said they welcome FDA's involvement in setting industry standards so that individuals would get similar results regardless of the service they used. But when asked what that meant and if they were prepared to suspend sales and marketing until FDA had all that done, 23 and Navigenetics declined to do so, and Pathway Genomics had already, had already halted their uh, direct-to-consumer offering after the Walgreens circumstance. The other thing that happened at these hearings, which caught a lot of um, publicity, a lot of news coverage, is that Greg uh, Cutts at the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, talked about an investigation that they had been conducted into several of these direct-to-consumer genetic uh, testing companies. Um, here is a, a, a cover sheet, and you can get to it in document 17, of their report. So the Government Accountability Office did what's called sort of a secret shopper investigation into these companies, discovering wide-ranging discrepancies on the results returned to the same individuals by different companies. Um, they stated that 68% of the time, donors got different information on the same disease risk from different companies. Additionally, they made some undercover calls to 15 of these companies and exposing a wide number of examples of deceptive marketing, misinformation, and other questionable practices. Company representatives, for example, made some highly misleading claims, telling the caller, for example, that a positive result for their cancer predisposition markers meant almost certainly getting cancer, or that DNA could be repaired with products that the company also sells, as well as, as fictitious celebrity endorsements. So uh, you could imagine um, this has uh, gotten uh, the interest of uh, some members of Congress, and, um, and it certainly was saying that Congressman Burgess was interested in talking to me about when I met with him, and I, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be some additional uh, scrutiny that's going to be uh, placed on this. So it was an interesting time. Um, on a related, although, it's, again, it's not the same thing, on a, but it is also relevant here, is that FDA uh, separately had um, a two-day meeting uh, that some people from the Institute attended uh, to solicit public comments about how to proceed with the regulation of lab-developed tests, uh, another genetic testing uh, issue that's very much at the forefront. Um, this was FDA's uh, proactive uh, attempt to really try to start getting their hands around some of these issues. 14 professional societies, nine clinical labs, 26 companies, three advocacy groups gave public comments, and some of them were listed. Fears of excessive regulatory burden, 
calls not to duplicate current efforts if FDA gets involved, um, need to address software analysis tool, how all this intersects with this thing I talked about earlier, the NIH's genetic test, uh, testing registry. Um, however, the direct-to-consumer genomics uh, may not be considered, uh, as I said earlier, lab-developed tests according to FDA. So this is, this is, uh, continues to be complicated. I just wanted to give you a flavor of what's transpired over the last four months. We're, we're going to, we're, we're obviously, many of us are keeping our eyes on this, but it's not exactly clear where all the, all the pieces are going to fall in the end. Um, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I told you all that without advancing. I, I, I got to keep a better eye on my uh, PowerPoint screens. Um, so that's what I just covered. Um, other interesting things that some of you may have heard about. Um, uh, regard um, universities' interest in personal genomics and using that as part of their curriculum, uh, which I, at the surface I think is a really interesting idea and is always the devils in the details and how it gets used and whether it involves real genetic information about individuals or fictitious. And so Stanford University uh, was one of two, uh, I don't know, something about the Bay Area, they're really getting into this, but one of them is Stanford. Um, and using this as part of medical genetics uh, or med medical school curriculum, they talked about a course that's trying to have students study genotype data. And then the one that got a little bit more um, um, crazy in some ways was uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, which uh, had to modify its original plans um, because of the lack of CLIA approval that was going into the, uh, the genetic information that was being generated. Um, about the students that were going to analyze their own data, so they had to modify their plans. But again, I think this is interesting to watch, and I think it feeds into sort of a broader set of discussions that are relevant around how are we going to educate public and medical students and residents and so forth around uh, these genomic advances. Um, uh, that leads in, it's a nice segue into um, this article, which I call to your attention in part because uh, I am trained as pathologist, and so I was interested in this uh, being published in the American Journal of Clinical Pathology, and in part because the second to last author is Mark Boguski, who many of you know is a, a, a member of the genomics community previous at NCBI and now find, is also trained as a pathologist, and I know Mark from our Washington University days where we both trained, and now finds himself uh, in, the pathology, in one of the pathology departments at one of the affiliated Harvard hospitals, and where they are taking the bull by the horn in some ways and are, are really um, pushing very aggressively in this article to describe how they believe that there's sort of a call to arms, they say a call to action, that, uh, that pathologists should get much more involved in um, genomics and personalized medicine and talk about a significant revamping of pathology curriculum, uh, postgraduate curriculum um, around uh, genomics. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens. I've, I've, I've actually, at a personal level, have found the field of pathology as someone who trained in pathology to be a bit asleep at the wheel for the last 20 years. And, uh, and this is sort of the first thing I've seen that, as in any way, I thought attempting to wake them up. I, I will point out that coming out of this article, as a result of this article, is actually a Banbury meeting that uh, these folks, Mark Boguski and Jeff Saffitz, who's a senior author, have organized. That'll be taking place sometime in the next few weeks. I'm attending it as well again, to try to sort of solidify this plan for a more widespread curriculum change in pathology training around genomics and personalized medicine. So again, another thing to watch. Um, it, it wouldn't be, you know, a four-month interval if there wasn't some wacko stories around personal genomics, so I have to always share those with you. Um, the wacko story, I think, of the past four months was this one around Ozzy Osbourne. Just fill the tabloids, both genomic tabloids and otherwise, you know, there is a company in St. Louis that is sequencing Ozzy Osbourne's genome for the rationale that they want to figure out genetically how he could survive so much drug abuse. So um, it, it, it just spread across the internet when this thing hit. So it's the bizarre story of the, of the, of the past four months. Uh, runner up is probably this one. Um, this is one that relates um, to Sitting Bull because researchers at the University of Copenhagen have approval of Sitting Bull's descendants to sequence DNA from a sample of his hair. And as the story went, if successful, would become the first ancient, non-frozen Native American's genome to be sequenced. So this was also sort of, but it, this came in second to Ozzy Osbourne, you have to, but it, it's a good one. Um, so those are my two crazy personal genome stories uh, of the past four months. On a, on a more serious note around personal genomes, um, Cold Spring Harbor meeting took place, ended yesterday at four or three or something. So um, this, in fact, several council members um, came directly uh, from that meeting to here. Um, Rick 
Rick Wilson was there. I know Rick Myers was there. Richard was one of the organizers. Um, I, I spoke at the meeting on Friday, but then I had to quickly scurry away to get ready for today. Um, I, I would only say, I, so I, didn't, I, don't, I don't have the full feeling of the meeting because I wasn't there. Um, being there just on Friday, one thing I do think is interesting, just at least from what I saw on Friday, is that um, if you sort of think about meeting space, whether it be the Cold Spring Harbor Genome Meeting in the spring, the Marco Island Meeting, American Society of Human Genetics Meeting, you know, whether, and then what this meeting has been doing, I, I think there are a set of issues that are coming to the forefront. I think we talked about them a lot in early, and certainly I think our strategic plan will start touching on them um, uh, around some of these issues about how we're really going to deploy this in a clinical setting and around CLIA certification and around analysis of individual genomes. And maybe all that area, that space will be taken up by, by existing meetings or whether a meeting like this will thrive by being uh, able to capture that. I don't, I don't know if there was a consensus at the meeting. I'm sure Richard as an organizer will be asked to think about that. I know Cold Spring Harbor is thinking about it. But, but I actually do think that, that th there are some really hard issues that clinically are going to have to be addressed. And I don't know where, where, wh what the right meeting venue is going to be that's going to absorb the critical debate around that. And I, whether it's this meeting, I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody wants to comment who was at that meeting. But I, 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 that was the one, from being there one day, that was my one observation, was the recognition that, that there's some hard things that we're going to be hearing about over the next five and 10 years as this really gets implemented um, in a clinical setting. OK, let me move on then um, to the extramural program. Um, and uh, lots going on. As always, we tend to start with our large-scale sequencing program. Um, the organisms uh, featured in the last four months. Um, first, uh, the International P. Amphid Consortium published a draft genome sequence of the P. Amphid and Floss biology. It's a major agricultural pest worldwide. This is really me. I'm going to abandon this. There we go. Uh, so agricultural pests worldwide and also a model organism for studying insect plant interactions. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the WashU researchers uh, published their draft sequence of the western clawed frog, otherwise known as Xenopus tropicalis in Science Magazine. Many of you know uh, Xenopus tropicalis is an important organism model um, for vertebrate development. Um, Meanwhile, WashU researchers also published a near-complete transcriptome of the canine hookworm in BMC genomics. Hookworm infection is one of the major, rare, neglected tropical diseases affecting about a billion people uh, per year in developing countries. Uh, moving to medical sequencing, um, Debbie Nickerson, who I showed you a picture of earlier, and Jay Shanduri used exome uh, sequencing, whole exome sequencing to discover that the MLL2 gene, when mutated, causes Kabuki syndrome. It's a very nice uh, study published in Nature Genetics. Uh, Kabuki, Kabuki syndrome is a rare pediatric disorder characterized, as you can tell by its name, from these facial, unusual facial appearances, um, and it also but is associated with more uh, other serious uh, consequences, such as heart defects, growth deficiency, mental retardation. Um, and that was a nice illustration of whole exome sequencing for identifying uh, medically important uh, genes. Moving on uh, to the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Harold is on board, um, really is enthusiastic about TCGA, and uh, has uh, really, it's been wonderful to start interacting with him with lots more to come. I think it's going to really be a, a new era for this important project, um, and there is a lot going on. I'm quite sure some elements that are going to change. I think Harold and I both have ideas um, about um, sort of thinking about version 2.0 of this and sort of the next phase. And, uh, and so I think there will be lots of things we'll be discussing in the upcoming months. Uh, meanwhile, they've got lots to do, um, and uh, they're marching along. Um, as an example, uh, the manuscript on ovarian cancer, um, uh, which has been in the works for a while, has now been submitted. Um, nearly 500 ovarian tumors were accrued and characterized. About a little over 300 of those cases underwent whole exome sequencing, and about 20,000 Somatic mutations were identified and have been analyzed and will continue to be analyzed. This is a very important paper and is now um, it's under review. And then meanwhile, lots of new data sets are out there, um, uh, everything from AML to colon, rectal, breast, and, and kidney cancers. Um, and in fact, these data sets are being made available on, on a rolling basis. Other major publication, I think just from last week or a week before, or something like that, um, the third generation map of the human genome. Uh, I mean, human genetic variation uh, that included the addition of about seven more populations. 
um, and really to get at uh, much more rare variants, a very nice paper. I know Richard was heavily involved in this. And, um, and this now represents the, the third of three major HapMap page papers to be published. Um, and if you're interested, that paper is available in document 25. Uh, in terms of genetic variation, a thousand genomes project marches along. Um, they have uh, released data from the pilot projects and have also have submitted a paper uh, that's undergoing revision now uh, that hopefully will be published uh, in early November, uh, describing their early efforts. The FTP site um, has more than uh, 10 gigabases of sequence data for about 624 samples, and variants from the first 1,100 samples will be released uh, by, uh, by November. So, um, and, uh, so in any case, lots, lots going on on 1,000 genomes as well. Not um, one of our programs, but just something that relates to these kinds of variation projects um, and population sequencing, the Wellcome Trust um, and Sanger Institute announced um, this UK 10K uh, project, which aims um, over the next three years to completely sequence about 4,000 well phenotyped individuals and uh, sequence the exomes of about 6,000 people with particular dis disorders. So again, it's, uh, this is a Wellcome Trust pursuit, um, not, not directly involved with us, but certainly something we want to watch and, uh, and be aware of, and certainly it's, it'll be a data set that'll be of, of great interest to the scientific community. Turning our attention to DNA sequencing technology program, um, there's several documents uh, under number 28 that are, are worth uh, looking at uh, and activities ongoing. Um, I believe the press release goes out today. Um, for 10 new uh, awards or continuing awards uh, under our $1,000 Genome Sequencing Technology Development Program. Um, and so if you want to read about that, uh, look at that press release. Um, in addition, I, we, we wanted to point out it's a remarkable accomplishment um, that have really taken place by our grantees as, as an example. Um, our grantees have published about 50 papers in the past year alone um, describing uh, their work that we are funding in, in this program. And so we actually have compiled that um, if, you, if you wanted to take a look. Um, meanwhile, in terms of future uh, efforts, we've reissued the RFA for R01, R21, and SBIR grant applications with three application receipt dates in October for each of the next uh, three years. And uh, so uh, continuing our pursuits there. And also there's, there's a nice story we wrote about our program that featured on the website, and that's also uh, one of the documents under number 28. Our ENCODE and MOD ENCODE program, um, several things to update. Um, in July, uh, the ENCODE Analysis Working Group um, uh, met in Barcelona, uh, focusing on analyses that will be uh, described in the ENCODE Integrative Analysis paper. Uh, there's a little, uh, little icon there that talks about a symposium that was uh, held uh, in Barcelona at the same time called the ENCODE Project 10 years after the human genome sequence. And then meanwhile, there's a meeting that's planned with the ENCODE PIs uh, later on this fall to work out the details of this important paper that they will be uh, preparing and hopefully submitting in the not too distant future. Speaking of papers, uh, the ENCODE uh, PIs have put together a user's guide uh, for ENCODE data. Rick, is it submitted yet or is it nearly submitted? About next week. Next week. So a week away, I, I've seen various drafts flying around, but a week, about a, in about a week from now, It'll be a user's guide to, to accessing and utilizing ENCODE data. MOD ENCODE, um, uh, the analysis working group is close to submitting separate integrative analysis papers, both for fly and for worm. So more papers are getting close to being submitted. And meanwhile, mouse ENCODE um, is up and running. Uh, four groups, you may recall, were, were funded um, uh, to, uh, to initiate ENCODE-like studies in mouse. And those are now up and going. Uh, again, this was money that came through uh, stimulus funding. Moving on to our, our SEGS program, Centers of Excellence in Genome Sciences. We currently support 10 active SEGS grants. Um, there is uh, one new award that was made this year, and that's to George Church. Um, and last year, NHGRI um, and NIMH uh, issued a revised program announcement, and the first set of applications in response to that announcement has been received, and it will be talking about at the February Council meeting. Um, it's notable that 2010 is the last year of funding for two of the original set of SEGS awards. So they've got their full 10 years of funding and can go on no more. Um, and those two individual PIs were Dee Dee Meldrum and Mike Snyder. 
And then, um, oh, I also, yeah, the application will be considered in February Council. And then the next grantee workshop of the SEGS, you can see the picture of this one from the 2009 meeting, the 2010 meeting, which will be held together with the NHGRI Diversity Action Plan workshop, will take place in Arizona State University uh, next month. And I will be attending that as well. Yes? You want to use your microphone? And, and we'll make sure to get a really close up video of you. So, um, is there a, a, not quota, but do we have a defined number of these? Is that how NHGRI thinks about it? Or is it, I mean, what if you got, you know, three more great applications than you would normally fund? What would you do? Um, our, we have guidance as to the total amount of money that's being spent on the program when it comes out to about 10 applications, but there's no strict uh, limit. As I recall, the amount allowed per year is two million, either direct or total, I can't remember, per year. And did anybody ever come in less than 1.9999 million? Uh, um, I'm not sure where ever, whether anyone ever came in for less than that. But uh, several have were awarded for less than that. <laughs> Okay, uh, moving on our, under our, for our LC program, just a, a couple, several updates I wanted to tell you. First of all, um, we were delighted to receive about $1.8 million of money from the Office of the Director for their bioethics common funds to support uh, three LC research grants as well as an administrative supplement. So that's external money coming into the Institute, which we always like to see. Um, Gene McEwen will actually be giving um, an update about uh, LC program issues during the open session. And the uh, last thing to point out is their triennial LC research conference uh, will be taking place in April of next year um, and uh, at Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And I'll, I'm actually planning to give a talk at that meeting as, as well. Um, Knockout Mouse Programmer Comp, which is uh, expanding its uh, research mission to include phenotyping, otherwise known as COMP2. And those RFAs have now been published for the knock, Knockout Mouse Phenotyping Project. And meanwhile, um, Original comp is on track to achieve its goals by the end of the project, which will take place by fall of 2011. You can sort of see the graph there that shows that they're pretty much keeping online with their, with their projection. Winding down a little now uh, in terms of extramural, um, let me just point out something I mentioned last time, but it continues, is that uh, our, a lot of issues around informatics and computational biology, one is just the challenge of the beast, of just issues associated with the science. The other is um, some internal issues related to our coordination with NCBI, which is complicated and, and from both sides, I can tell you. Um, and so we really, I think, are, are really found, I think, some ways to really help facilitate coordination. We now um, have these quarterly meetings with NCBI that uh, I put in place from early discussions uh, with Jim Astell and David Littman. I think it's really helped our communication, our coordination. We are much more this, things are just better set up to track projects and make them aware on both sides of what the needs are going to be and really to track progress and sort of resolve issues. We also have put into place uh, on a more official uh, position, Vivian Benazia, who's one of our um, extramural program officers, program directors, is now officially designated sort of the liaison between our institute and, and NCBI. So there's sort of a single point of contact that really helps uh, that communication channel. And I think that's also helping uh, Chris Wetterstrand, who's uh, now uh, working directly for me to help a, a, a whole host of issues associated with the extramural program and coordination and liaison type of activities, is actually helping Vivian on this because I regard this as so important for sort of getting better coordination and communication between us and, um, and NCBI. Uh, meanwhile, there's just a lot going on out there in terms of meetings and discussions and all that. And so we have Vivian and others going out and others on our staff going out to some important meetings. The, this beyond the genome meeting that's going to take place, there's going to be some additional discussion around cloud computing that has captured some of our attention. Um, and then we just got invited and are sending some staff um, uh, to this Penascale Computing and Personalized Medicine meeting that will take place at University of Illinois. Um, uh, really next month. Actually, both of these meetings are, are taking place next month. Okay, so that's extramural. And of course, we have all of Common Fund. I mean, we don't deal with all of Common Fund. We seem to deal with a lot of Common Fund. So lots of updates of things that 
we don't directly own, but uh, we co-own, if you will, um, starting with Human Microbiome Project, where we have major responsibility for leading. Um, there are several highlights. I, I, I don't want to steal all of Jane's thunder. I'll just steal a little. There was this wonderful paper that came out in Science describing in May, describing 178 microbial genome sequences, the first of their catalog being created by the Human Microbiome Project. Um, meanwhile, um, I was told, I uh, wasn't able to make it, that there was a terrific meeting that took place. Actually, Rick Wilson was just telling me that, that it was one of the local sponsors of it. That was a great meeting. I heard that from staff as well. Um, it took place just a couple of weeks ago, uh, really showing the ex remarkable growth in the field and, uh, and a lot of activity in, in the field. Um, we actually have just put, it, put out very recently um, a press release about new awards in three areas. Um, demonstration projects, technology development, and computational tools. Um, and uh, some of the first one relates to the future of uh, UH, previously were UH2 awards that now have uh, been approved to move on to UH3 awards. And uh, that's really all I want to say because Jane Peterson is going to be giving a larger presentation about human microbiome project. Um, another project I want to tell you about a uh, common fund project is GTEx or genotype tissue expression. Um, by way of background, um, uh, this is a, one of these common fund projects being co-led, in this case, by us and by NIMH. It has a pilot um, funding for two years, and it's the real goal of the pilot is to show the feasibility of collecting high-quality RNA for expression analysis from multiple tissues from the same uh, deceased donor. Um, and so the idea over this two-and-a-half or roughly two-year pilot is to collect uh, multiple tissues um, from about 160 deceased donors and to be able to do expression QTL analyses. Now, what's happened so far is that an award has now been made to the Broad Institute for a contract to serve as a laboratory data analysis and coordinating center. Um, meanwhile, uh, the University of Miami um, will serve as the brain bank. Um, basically, whole brains will be sent there. I'm actually using supplemental funds that are being co-funded by NIMH, NINDS, and NIDA, sort of the brain institutes, if you will. Um, there will soon be awards that will be made for three to four biospecimen source sites. Uh, this is being awarded as a contract um, as part of a larger initiative at NCI called CA Hub for the Cancer Human Biobank. We're sort of grafting off of them, if you will, um, to sort of get this project up and going. Um, there is going to be sort of an inaugural GTEx kickoff meeting uh, at the end of September. And uh, importantly, we also, um, in part of my request and Tom Insel's request, put in place an external scientific panel to provide us uh, external feedback about, about the project, and in part because we need to assess if this pilot is successful. If it is successful, the idea is that it would scale up to something like 1,000 donors over years three to five. But that's just not going to happen if, unless we clearly show the, that the pilot phase has been successful. Another roadmap project um, uh, uh, that we have uh, major leadership responsibilities for is Library of Integrated Network-Based Cellular Signatures, or LINCS. In this case, we co-lead this project with the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. It is a pilot with three years of funding, three million years this year, 10 million, year, 10 million next year, and 10 million the year after. The goal is to facilitate a mechanistic understanding of disease in support of drug and biomarker development. This will be done by creating a library of perturbation-induced cellular signals that will relate cellular responses to genetic variation, environmental exposures, and clinical phenotypes, but also to develop computational tools and approaches to analyze cellular signatures and new technologies for generating novel signatures. Updates to tell you is that there's um, several RFAs out um, around, um, that are, have been out um, around these phase one initiatives, and those are listed there, uh, some of which are still active. Uh, the first of which uh, relates to these U54 awards, and those awards now have been uh, issued. There's two of them, um, to Todd Gollop at the Broad and Tim Mitchelson at Harvard. Um, first meeting of the grantees is taking place uh, later this month, and uh, obviously there's a lot of early uh, collaboration and coordination and data standardization that needs to take place will be the goal of this first meeting. Another common fund initiative that we are responsible for co-leading um, is the protein capture reagent, so, certainly something that's been discussed. Uh, we've discussed this at the Institute, and, and uh, it's one of the new uh, common fund initiatives. Uh, ultimate goal of this would be to generate renewable community resource of high quality affinity reagents for all human proteins. Um, um, th such a resource would enable a wide range of applications. Uh, some of them are 
immunoprecipitation based, such as for chip studies and protein-protein interaction studies, but also reagents for immunostaining and, and uh, antibody arrays and so forth. Um, the initial plan is to prioritize monoclonals and initially to start with human transcription factors and immunoprecipitation applications. One could imagine how that could feed into efforts such as those going on in the ENCODE project. Um, and uh, that's where that will start. But there's also going to be encouragement to develop uh, better alternatives than current ways of making affinity reagents. Um, obviously, lots of challenges being considered, uh, technical capabilities and the variety of applications that one could imagine. There's issues about scalability, how are we going to do this with all human proteins eventually, and also issues around intellectual property. The next Common Fund initiative, another new one that we're responsible for, um, is in global health. Um, this one is, is particularly complicated. In fact, uh, at the moment, we don't have another institute. It's, it's, we're taking the lead on this um, at, at an institute level alone, in part because it doesn't just involve the NIH. Um, and uh, this, this thing now has a name. It's called H3Africa for Human Heredity and Health in Africa. That name was announced at a joint press event that um, I emceed at, at the Wellcome Trust in London back in June. And uh, Francis uh, came by to represent NIH, and Charles Rotimi, who was an intramural investigator in intramural program, who's been heavily involved in helping to, to formulate the early plans of what has now been named H3Africa. Um, represents a joint venture with the Wellcome Trust. Um, and so this is a common fund initiative being jointly funded with the Wellcome Trust, but also being done in close coordination with the African Society of Human Genetics. Um, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of people involved, which is part of the reason this makes it complicated. Initially, NIH has pledged about $25 million in common fund money over five years. Wellcome Trust has so far pledged something on the order of $12 million or so. So we had this big press announcement uh, back in June. Um, and uh, But that announcement actually came uh, independent of the fact that uh, Charles Rotimi and myself and people in the Wellcome Trust had been coordinating some efforts around this really for the better part of a couple of years now, starting with a meeting that took place uh, uh, in Cameroon, Africa, associated with the last meeting of the African Society of Human Genetics meeting. And uh, at that time, we didn't even know Francis was going to be an IH director, but we were incubating an idea of having such a population-based study in Africa. And thinking about the complexities, you can imagine how quickly you get, it gets complicated. To, and the idea is to do the studies there, not to go get samples and do the studies here. And so we set into motion and now just have an official umbrella for some working groups that mostly consist of African scientists um, to help formulate a plan to give to the Wellcome Trust and to us. And they had a meeting uh, back in August of, of this past year, or just about last month. And this is a photograph of, of, of some of the people at that meeting. And these two working groups have, are putting together some recommendations that will feed into um, uh, both the Wellcome Trust and, and to us um, to sort of uh, help uh, get organized uh, to get this out of the gates. Uh, we will update you uh, probably at a future council meeting uh, with the details once we understand the details. It's just very complicated at the moment. You can imagine doing something with another funding agency, African scientists, African scientists, a lot of issues around this. But um, we, we think we're getting some traction, but it's, it is a complicated choreography, needless to say. OK. Updates from the office of the director. Um, and we are, uh, we can almost see the, the finish line in sight here. Um, New England Journal of Medicine, we have um, uh, Greg Firo and Alan Guttmacher as series editors of a new series, uh, it's the second such series in genomic medicine. Uh, there are going to be 13 total authors, uh, 13 total articles uh, coming out about every six weeks. All these are freely available um, uh, through an agreement with New England Journal. And three of them are out so far. Um, and if you haven't seen them, I encourage you to see them and have your students see them because they are terrific. Um, uh, Greg and Alan and Francis uh, did this first one, sort of an updated uh, primer or primer, if you will. Um, then the second one is a terrific article that Terry Manolio uh, wrote on genome-wide association studies. And then uh, the third one, Hal Dietz just uh, had this one come out on therapeutic approaches to Mendelian diseases. So again, you can get to links on that from in document 35, but uh, there'll be 13 total coming out every six weeks or so. Um, uh, our, our Office of Director uh, Education branch put together, um, or helped facilitate, I guess I should say, uh, coordinated with some outside groups as well, um, a, a program that brought to NIH 
in June, 60 very senior judges, very impressive group from all across the country, including Hawaii and the Virgin Islands, to, to talk and give a program on genomics, medicine, and discrimination. To give you a flavor for this, among these 60 judges, six were chief justices of state Supreme Courts, 20 were associate justices of state Supreme Courts, of state Supreme Courts two federal court judges, including a U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit judge. Um, they were, this was in a very, uh, just a wonderful group to speak to. I gave a, 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 an hour, hour and 15 minute lecture or something like that. And uh, their questions were just fantastic. And uh, they were just riveted the whole day. Here's a photograph of them with Bob Blakesley, who runs uh, the sequencing group at the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center. They got a tour up close front what sequencing center looks like. And um, it was NHGRI speakers and NIH speakers and even brought in some academic speakers. And topics were just uh, what you might imagine they were. And it was, it was really terrific. So I just wanted to share that with you. Also this summer, we once again um, had uh, our, what we call our short course, our summer workshop in genomics. Um, it's, uh, it was held in August uh, for 35 participants from 18 colleges and universities. About two thirds of the participating schools are minority serving institutions. Five historically black colleges and universities, five Hispanic serving institutions, one tribal college and university. Um, and, uh, and, and they all bring with them, um, or most of them bring with them uh, trainees and students. That, and we have separate programs for them as well as the general lectures. Some of the students get to go shadow trainees in our labs, in our intramural labs. And, um, and they get just a, 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 I gave a lecture, as did a lot of members of our staff, gave lectures on different topics. We also this year got involved our NIH Office of Intramural Training and Education um, to talk about um, uh, faculty mentoring and offering um, some input and training about how to teach a diverse group of students, especially in areas of science such as genomics. Um, been some uh, interesting developments around sickle cell. Um, in April, many of you may be aware, that NCI approved a mandatory testing of athletes uh, for sickle cell carrier status, um, which has uh, lots of interesting issues surrounding. And if you're interested in those issues, uh, Vince Bonham, um, in conjunction with uh, Larry Brody, one of our intramural investigators, uh, uh, joined uh, George Dover of Johns Hopkins to publish this perspective piece in New England Journal, which you can get to in document 38, uh, that discusses some of, the, some, some of the issues surrounding this and some of the, the things that are worth considering um, in, in this policy. Um, sickle cell is relevant this year also from the point of view that it's the 100th anniversary of the first description of sickle cell anemia in the Western medical literature. And so NIH is having a symposium around this uh, event called the James B. Herrick Symposium after the author of that paper. Um, and this will take place on the NIH campus in November. Um, we are a co-sponsor along with seven other institutes and centers who are involved in this. Vince Bonham has been quite involved in organizing this and providing, getting speakers and so forth. Um, in terms of uh, other workshops I wanted to mention to you, there's two I, I specifically wanted to mention that we are just in the, oh, actually a fairly mature stage of planning. Um, one of them uh, relates to what um, Alan Guttmacher and I started talking about um, actually before he was appointed director, but still he was acting director and it was a great thing to be talking about, was the idea that it just seemed that the, the, the meeting of, of newborn screening as a field with new sequencing technologies and genomic advances was very ripe, and yet we weren't sure there was a good research agenda around that interface. And so we thought we should have a workshop around that to try to frame a research agenda. And I think it's a prototype of the kinds of ways we'll be interacting with the Child Health Institute. So this thing will take place uh, later, this, uh, later this year in December um, and uh, represent sort of a two institute uh, workshop. And I could imagine coming out of that might be um, ideas for funding opportunities maybe that would be jointly pursued by, uh, by the two institutes. And then I found when in sitting at the early meeting that one of the things I got personally confused about and felt undereducated about were a lot of issues around uh, electronic health records, electronic medical records, and what the challenges would be as genomic information started to be generated about individuals. Um, if you recall, for those who are there, there was some pretty spirited debate where some people said this is a solves problem and some people saying this is a huge problem. And I will. T I also hear, I mean, needless to say, the, the Obama administration has this as a very high priority to get their hands around the development of electronic medical and health records. And I sort of felt that we as an institute, we already are, but we will increasingly be called into providing input 
around the genomic aspects of such systems. And I, I felt we needed to be educated better and wiser. Why do I have great people who I respect saying completely contradictory things in a topic that I think is actually very important for us right now? So I put into motion um, the idea that we should have a workshop about this. And so that's been, um, it's been um, developed. Uh, it's not going to be until the spring. Um, and uh, I, I, think, I think we need to get some traction on this to better understand it. And I would, would imagine we'll be calling on some of you to help us uh, uh, in that workshop or participate in that workshop and think about things down the road that we should be doing to stimulate development, to stimulate research in this area. A big event that's going to take place here in Washington, D.C. in October is the U.S. Science and Engineering Festival. It's going to take place on the mall downtown, also going to spill over into Freedom Plaza. And uh, NIH um, was asked to participate in a fairly big way, as you could imagine, being local. And uh, once again, Genome Institute are overachievers, so disproportionately asked to do more uh, than most other institutes. So we're involved in something like six activities, all sorts of things of demoing, purifying DNA from strawberries. and and building, uh, you know, family trees and genetic uh, traits and, and all sorts of game show kind of stuff. So anyway, we're doing a lot, and, uh, but it's fun. This is the kind of outreach stuff we should be doing. It's local and, uh, and it's expected to have quite a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, participation uh, down in the mall, especially if the weather's nice. So, um, winding down, needless to say, uh, I don't know, if you don't know about this, I don't know where you've been the last few months. But uh, the Deepwater Horizon disaster, if you will, um, from late April causing the oil spill, really you would think at first blush, why, why does this involve NIH and why does it involve NHGRI? Um, and at first that might have been my response, but um, it didn't take long uh, before uh, Francis, for example, announced uh, that NIH intended to do a long-term study of, of the cleanup workers as a cohort to be led by NIEHS. Um, and NIEHS and the Common Fund jointly contributing about $28 million for this um, over the next five years, um, although uh, they likely would follow these individuals for upwards of 10 to 20 years. Um, the focus would be to, on the cleanup workers uh, because of the likely heavy exposure. Um, part of this is because there's been very few long-term studies of such individuals who have, have been involved in such cleanup, and there have been some suggestion that maybe there's some genotoxic effects associated uh, with this as well. And the plans were also to study other vulnerable populations, especially children and pregnant women. Um, again, all this was sort of going to take place at another institute over there. We would be aware of it, unclear we would have to get involved. Uh, that, that sort of kind of changed with a phone call. Um, uh, Terry Manolio was asked uh, to step in and actually uh, co-lead this effort uh, because of her uh, credentials and, and skills and background, uh, along with Harold Jaffe, the CDC. Um, uh, this has had a substantial impact on, on Terry, needless to say, who's been a real hero in this. It's a bit of a thankless effort, but, um, and it's, it certainly has had an impact on us because we haven't had Terry as much because she's been completely hijacked by this, uh, but it is just one of these things you sort of have to do. Um, um, and, but it, and, and, and we are hoping that there might be some good genetic studies that would come out of this, uh, but it's not entirely clear that will be the case or not. I have a feeling Francis might talk a little bit about this, so I don't want to say much more of Terry can tell you all about it in as much gory detail as you want. But it, it's, it's a very complicated, multi-agency kind of thing, a lot of political overtones. So it's, you can imagine it's, it's not a simple thing. I'll also tell you that uh, the Chemical Genomics Center was asked to, to do some work on this as well, to study some of the dispersants, the dispersants, dispersants that were used and, and look at some of the toxicology associated with those. So, you know, this is one of these things that when asked, we're jumping in. But it's, uh, at first you wouldn't have thought we would be involved, but indeed we are. I am almost done because I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the intramural program. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, uh, I've, I've kept you updated about our undiagnosed diseases program, in part because you hear a lot about it because there's been so much news coverage. That news coverage has not let up. Um, Bill Gall came and told you about it last September. Um, I will just tell you, if you wanted to hear the first, some just statistics I was recently given about the program, um, and by way of reminder, those who don't know, this is a program where individuals out in the community who have failed, the system has failed to give them a diagnosis because of their disease, can apply, their physician can, uh, can submit them for consideration in this program that, that is an NIH-wide program at our clinical center, but Bill Gall directs and NHGRI hosts, but involves clinicians from all different institutes. And over the last two years, there uh, have been 3,000 inquiries so far of individuals. About 1,200 of them, uh, we've accepted the medical records to review. And in 280 cases or so, 
um, the patients have been accepted and either have been brought in or are bringing, being brought in. Um, and uh, I will also tell you that uh, quite a lot of them now, we have a pretty good pipeline going for a whole exome sequencing of patients where we think there's, there's, we can get genetic traction. Um, and indeed, there's been some nice uh, uh, successes. Uh, in fact, at least a couple of them papers are sort of probably likely to be coming out in the next six months where rare disease genes have been identified or, or where previously implicated disease genes have been implicated in, in, a, in a variant form of the disease that was unrecognizable at the, at the clinical level. And until you did the genomics, did you really know what was going on um, at a genetic level? Um, Sanjay Gupta continues to show up about once a month to interview people or to interview Bill or to follow patients and so forth. And I guess Bill really made it to the big time because there was a big feature article in People Magazine. So you know, it's one thing to be in CNNs, but when you hit People Magazine, then you know you're someone. So okay, it's actually not a bad story uh, in this, about this one patient and uh, that was followed here. In terms of uh, scientific accomplishments, I, in document 41, just lists some papers and press releases associated with, uh, I picked three individuals this time. Colleen McBride had some nice stories and papers coming out on the Multiplex project. Uh, Ying Zi Yang has some uh, work on cell, a very nice nature paper that just came out about cell polarity. And Elaine Ostrander's had a couple very nice dog genetics genomics papers. That, so, so those three I just thought I would highlight and you could look at the details under document 41. So I will stop there. I will tell you that um, I, I, this is a lot of material and a lot of stuff all put together. I want to give a special thanks to Chris Waterstrand who helped put this document together, which means interfacing with about 30 other people at the Institute and trying to get them to get everything in on time and get to me and get it organized so that we can get all this stuff posted on the web. And it was the first time I was working with Chris on this. So thank you. And um, I will stop there.